Um, uh, thank you for for the introduction. Um, it's uh, it's Friday and it's been a very long week, so I'm going to give a kind of easy talk. I'm going to paint in fairly with a fairly broad brush. Um, this is a project that's been going on for for some years since since 2010, um, and I've written written quite quite a bit about it. Uh, so I'm just going to give you an overview of, of the situation. Okay. Whoops. All right. So the kind of motivating question here is, uh, it, it, it may seem somewhat mysterious. It may not seem somewhat mysterious. How sensitive is a mathematical structure to its underlying logic, right? So that's kind of loaded to use the word it's there. I'm just trying to move the people off to the side so I can see my slide. Um, you won't move. <laughs> okay, uh, so does the change of the underlying often first order logic always involve a change in the structure? So by the end of the talk, I, I think you'll have an idea what I mean by that. Of course, this is, this is what we all do in logic, right? So this is something you should, you should recognize. Uh, okay, so um, have to move. Uh, okay, trying to figure out where to put the people. All right, all right. So I'm going to start talking about uh, Gödel's Princeton bicentennial lecture, 1946. So this was um, an occasion. Uh, 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 a session that Tarski had organized on computability. What's the matter? Yeah, Tarski had organized on computability and he invited Gödel. Gödel offered to give a 10 minute talk. So uh, this 10 minute talk I've been thinking about for well, one year, a minute for about, for about 10 years. Um, okay, so here's, here's the opening of the talk. He says, Tarski has sketched in his lecture the great importance, and I think justly, of the concept of general recursiveness or, or tur Turing computability. He says, it seems to me that this importance is largely due to the fact that with this concept, one has succeeded in giving an absolute definition of an interesting epistemological notion, i.e. one not depending on the formalism chosen. In all other cases treated previously, such as demonstrability or definability, one has been able to define them only relative to a given language. And for each individual language, it's clear that the one thus obtained is not the one looked for. So uh, being definable in set theory, this is not definable. With provability, of course, we have the and complete this theorem is the topic of your meeting. This, so then he continues, this I think should encourage one to expect the same thing to be possible also in other cases, such as demonstrability or definability. It is true that for these other cases, there exist certain negative results, such as the incompleteness of every formalism, but close examination shows that these results do not make a definition of the absolute notion concerned impossible under all circumstances, but only exclude certain ways of defining them, or at least that certain very closely related concepts may be definable in an absolute sense. So, uh, so we have three notions, computability, definability, and provability. And the idea is to, uh, to make the intuitive concept uh, uh, precise. So the intuitive concept of definability to be made precise, Gödel says in the lecture, is comprehensibility by our mind. Now, it's interesting that Post had also asked for the exact same thing. Um, he had also asked for absolute notions of provability and definability. Martin Davis told me that he thought he picked the wrong one, provability. He told him he should have picked definability. Okay, the context of the 1946 lecture is something that you are all uh, very familiar with, right? The, the history of the computability in the 30s, it's fascinating history. 
So uh, it was dominated by the adequacy problem for the concept of the intuitive concept, human effectively computable, uh, various systems, of course, post systems come up in the 20s, but uh, most of the other ones are coming in the 30s. And uh, they had established confluence, right? But um, of these various systems, but they weren't really uh, convinced, they didn't really see the adequacy problem as solved by, by the confluence of these systems until the Turing uh, Turing machine came along. So Gödel says to Martin Davis um, in the 60s, I was at the time of these lectures not at all convinced that my concept of recursion comprises all possible recursions, right? The Herbron Gödel recursiveness. Um, Kleene would write in this uh, in, in 1981, Turing's computability is intrinsically persuasive, but lambda definability is not intrinsically persuasive, and general recursiveness scarcely so. It's author Gödel being at the time not at all persuaded. Okay. Um, uh, but then the Turing machine comes along, and uh, so Gödel to Hao Wang is. Uh, is speaks about about this um, in in the strongest possible terms. In fact, it it he, as far as I can remember, um, he very rarely spoke in such emphatic terms <laughs> about anything in logic. So uh, he says the the resulting definition. So this would have been in, in the sixties. The resulting definition of the concept of mechanical by the sharp concept of performable by a Turing machine is both correct and unique. And here's a statement that I love. Moreover, it is absolutely impossible that anybody who understands the question and knows Turing's definition should decide for a different concept. And then he continues, the sharp concept is there all along, only we did not perceive it clearly at first. This is similar to our perception of an animal far away and then nearby. We had not perceived the sharp concept of mechanical procedure sharply um, before Turing, who brought us to the right perspective. Um, now, this idea of formalism independence, it's something that um, I associate very much with Gödel. It's, it hasn't, people haven't really talked about it in the literature. Um, but it's it's certainly there once you start looking for it. It's all it's all over the place. So I put this in for you, Harvey, because you have your remark about the, the CH yesterday. So um, he says uh, so talking about uh, ind formalism independence. He says the consistency proof for the CH is absolute. That is independent of the particular formal system which we use for mathematics. So Harvey would say that's that's overstating the case, or there's, there's more to be said there. Okay, a um, little bit of philosophy for you. I can't hear you, Harvey, you're muted, but that's okay. You can, you can talk about it later. Uh, so Goethe would use the language of Kantian ideas to conceptualize this process of, of sharpening. So he says, uh, and again, this is to Wong, absolute demonstrability and definability are not concepts, but inexhaustible Kantian ideas. We never describe an idea in words exhaustively or completely clearly, but we also perceive it more and more clearly. This process may be uniquely determined. Now, what are Kantian ideas? Well, if you know your Kant, um, so here, here is a nice way of, of putting it by M. M. Rolf. So Kantian ideas are imaginary focal points that guide our study of nature and help us to achieve a more extensive and interconnected system of knowledge. Uh, the idea is that these are ideas of reason and as such, they're directed toward transcendental objects, right? Um, objects that lie beyond experience. And as I say, if you know, if you know your Kant, we don't have knowledge of what lies beyond experience. So, so it's kind of interesting discontinuity in, in Gödel's thinking. 
so Rolf continues um, these ideas, these transcendental ideas inevitably produce the illusion that we have a priori knowledge about our objects corresponding to them. This putative knowledge seems to satisfy reason's demand for the unconditioned, though in fact these are only ideas that do not give us knowledge about transcendent objects, but only produce the illusion of doing so. Now, our understanding of Gödel's Platonism, right, would certainly have him reject the idea of reason having a structural, built-in structural capacity for error, right? So, so Gödel acknowledges this. He says it's not satisfactory to conceive that absolute provability or the general concept of concept is, is an idea. Uh, so that's Gödel on on absolute definability and absolute provability. There's a lot more to be said about that. Uh, Kreisel, of course, is always uh, snickering on the sidelines. So he says uh, for Kreisel, absolute provability and definability are incalcitrant notions that preoccupied or paralyzed Gödel since his lecture at Princeton. So after 1946, Gödel's in a state of paralysis uh, and I would say, but Hod, <laughs> Hod, which is uh, first appears in, in the 46th lecture, is, is a very great, very great thing. We'll get to Hod later. Okay, the concept, now what about the scope problem for, for Gretel? So the concept of formal system is now sharpened, solving the, the scope problem. So perhaps many of you have seen this, and Gretel says, uh, again, in, in the 60s, um, this, is, um, this is a note to the 31 paper, later note, in consequence of later advances, in particular of the fact that due to uh, Turing's work, a precise and unquestionably adequate definition of the general concept of formal system can now be given the existence of undecidable arithmetical propositions and the non-demonstability of the consistency of a system in the same system can now be proved rigorously for every consistent system containing a certain amount of planetary number theory. So this is, this is a claim that's been much discussed at this meeting, of course, especially regarding the word every, that's my bold face, not turtles. Turing's work gives an analysis of the concept of mechanical procedure. Uh, this is equivalent to the notion of a Turing machine. A formal system can simply be defined to be any mechanical procedure for producing formulas, called provable formulas. Uh, and I'm bold facing this phrase mechanical procedure. Um, later footnote to his 34 lecture, again, uh, uh, he's, he's saying, when I first published my paper, uh, the 31 paper, the result could not be pronounced in this generality because the notions of mechanical procedure and formal system had not been satisfactorily defined, but this gap has since been filled in by Herr von Turing. and Turing. You, essential point is to find what a procedure is, then the notion of formal system follows easily. And then he says, interesting footnote, um, in my opinion, the term formal system or formalism should never be used for anything but this notion that is a mechanical procedure. Now, I've always wondered about this, and the more I think about it, the more I wonder about it. Uh, so this is 1936, um, the Turing machine that is arrives in, in 1936. Uh, I think it was a little bit precipitous of Gattel, and I think in, you know, it, it's been shown at this, at this meeting um, to regard the scope problem as solved uh, by Turing in this, in this way is um, considering how careful Gödel was in other areas. And I mean, both mathematically, as has been established at this meeting, but also philosophically, right? I mean, there's a lot to think about here. So I, I think it was a little bit precipitous, but um, that's, a, that's a different topic. The idea here is what does Turing, uh, what does Gödel take from Turing, what is the sort of general schema here? We had confluence, but then we had a grounding example, 
right? An example, the Turing machine, which was unquestionably adequate, uh, to which all the other um, all the other conceptions of computability were were equivalent. So it was a two pronged uh, schema. Um, now I just want to make a little aside into uh, make it make an aside. So this idea of you know this pronouncement, these emphatic pronouncements about you know we are now completely done with the scope problem. We understand what a formalism is. Um, Turing has explained this, you know, on, on to the next thing. Um, as I say, to me, it's a little bit precipitous. So I started wondering about the power of the machine metaphor, which was certainly um, very much in the air, the machine metaphor in the 1930s, but it's, it's, very, it's old, right? So 1748, l'homme machine, uh, soul is, Clearly, enlightened machine, 1900. Uh, Anson Rabinock, Rabinock writes that the human motor, right, the body as machine. This was a key metaphor of the industrial era. The futurists, right, Marinetti's manifesto of futurism, glorification of the machine. He famously said a roaring motor car, which seems to run on machine gun fire, is more beautiful than the victory of Samothrace. Um, they were they were wonderful artists, but they were complete idiots outside of outside of art. I mean, saying things like so. Severini sat out the war, but Madinetti says, you know, just enjoy World War One. Try to live it pictorially, studying it in all its marvelous mechanical forms. I mean, they were just complete jackasses. But the the point is the the futurism huge exhibition at the Guggenheim a few years ago. Futurism was a beautiful thing in our very important movement. Um, and uh, I, I think it's a sign of this, this, the power of this machine, machine metaphor. And when I read Gödel, now I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find something more than this, but you know, Gödel keeps using this phrase over and over again, you know, mechanical procedure, mechanical procedure. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot to say about this, but these these metaphors, body as machine, machine as as body, they kind of feed into each other, and I think that must have influenced. Um, now, did it? Of course, as we all know, Turing talks about the human computer, right? There's, there must be some some literature on this with respect to Turing, but I think also one could one could think about Gödel in this respect. Okay, so there's. Uh, there is Man is Machine, very famous a sculpture of uh, Umberto Boccioni, 1913, Unique Forms of Continuity in Space is, is a title. Okay, back to Princeton, back to Gödel's bicentennial lecture. So in the lecture, he it's three pages, 10 minute lecture. So we've got three, uh, as he calls them, epistemological notions, computability, provability, and definability, each of them come with their own paradoxes. For each notion, we want transcendence, uh, absoluteness is, is Gödel's term, but we also want to avoid undefinability in set theory. Now, uh, this is 36, 37, uh, Gödel, proves the consistency of the continuum hypothesis. So this is right after, uh, but Gödel supposedly right before that, he, he's, he's telling everybody, jetzt mengen lehre, now, now to, now to set. So we're gonna follow, <laughs> we're gonna follow Gödel, jetzt mengen lehre. Um, so I'm, I'm going to tell you about a project that's been going on since uh, 2010. And uh, this is an implementation. And again, I want to stress that 37, we get the consistency of the CH, 36, we get the Turing machine. So, you know, all, all of this is, is, is very much on, on, uh, on, on Gödel's uh, mind, of course, in, in, in 46. So if Gödel wants an absolute notion of definability, um, a transcendent notion, right? So if 
we take seriously what the Turing machine meant to him, what his appropriation of uh, the entire schema, this confluence plus rounding and so on. Uh, how are you going to create a similar situation for definability? So that's what, that's what inspires this work, that, that question. So uh, in the lecture, Gretel talks about the constructible hierarchy, the constructible sets, and he also talks about the hereditarily ordinal definable sets. As we all know, the, in the CH uh, is provable in the constructible hierarchy, GCH being constructible, this is absolute. Uh, HOD is forcing fragile, I will define HOD for you in a second, model of CFC, uh, and the CH can go either way, and being hereditarily ordinal definable is definable. Okay, so here's, here's the constructible hierarchy, right? You begin with the empty set, and then at successor levels, you collect together all the sets which are definable with parameters on the previous level, and you take unions at limits. Uh, hereditarily ordinal definable sets, we take the ordinals as primitive terms, and then a set is said to be ordinal definable, if it's ordinal definable, just in the way that's written there, and a set is hereditarily ordinal definable, if it's ordinal, if it's ordinal definable, if all its elements are, if all the elements of elements are, right? and so so oh, that's Hod. Hod has turned out to be very, very important. Now, I didn't know about this when we started this work, but I soon found out that uh, my Helen Scott, and you know, quite early, so in 54 or so, um, they substituted second order logic for the first order um, version of, of constructability. And it turns out you get the hereditarily ordinal definable set. So that was the first, first result, one of the first results. Chang does the same thing with L omega one, omega one, in place of first order logic, but assuming large part, uncountably many measurables, it doesn't satisfy his choice. And it's also not a fragment of second order logic. So in our work, we've been interested in fragments of second order logic. Okay, so here is what I claim, uh, or here's, here, Here's the implementation of Gödel's suggestion, right? I'm not talking about exegesis here. I'm not talking about interpretation, right? That would be a different story. This is an implementation, right? So you have something fixed, you have something varying, you're looking for robustness uh, or, or in, in Gandhi's terminology, um, confluence. So, uh, we do just what um, just what 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 is natural to do, right? So we take the constructible hierarchy and we switch out the underlying first order logic for another logic, right? Typically, a fragment of second order logic, and you'll see the logics that that I mean. Now, if v equals l, then v equals hot equals Chang not Chang's model. Everything is is equal, but I think I said before, right, AC fails in the Chang model. So you, you'll disrupt this chain of equalities. So looking ahead, and as I said, we started working on this in 2010, um, Gödel's L is very robust. So it's not limited to first order logic. There is a huge class of logic you, you can substitute for first order logic, you get L back. Same for Hod, uh, although that's, we didn't investigate that to the same extent. And then you get uh, some potentially interesting new inner, inner models with other logics. Okay, so uh, all of the LQ alphas. Now, um, I think this is changing, but people haven't been interested in these strong, strong logics. Um, uh, but this is, after all, part of our, our, our ordinary speech, right? At least for low alpha. So uh, this doesn't make any difference. You can add those quantifiers 
to the concept of definability and you get L back a weak second order, weak second order logic. So quantifying only over finite sets, absolute logics and so on, right? So here's what I mean by absolute being in, in, the, in, in the language is, is recursive in phi and the satisfaction predicate is delta one in M and phi and ZFC and so on. Okay, How, a quick way to avoid L, right, is um, by using L omega one omega or L infinity omega, right, for very simple reasons. And now here's where things get a little bit interesting. Suppose we um, think about the Magador Mallets quantifier, and on the other hand, the, the co finality quantifier. So, Magador Mallets quantifier says so Q1MM XY phi XY says there's an uncountable X such that phi AB for all of AB and X. We can express with this quantifier the susalinity of a tree, that is, that it has no uncountable antichains. Now, this logic is countably compact. Right, so um, with respect to countable theories, and it has Lowenheim scaling down to L of one. So if you have a model, you have a model of size L of one, and it can be badly, um, it can be badly uh, incompact. That is to say, in a forcing extension. Now, our other logic is the cofinality quantifier. This was introduced by Shelock, right? Q zero cof x, y, phi, x, y says phi. Sorry, Sam, <laughs> here's a linear order coming at you. Phi is a linear order, phi defines a linear order of cofinality omega. This is fully compact. And again, Lowenheim, scroll them down to L of one. Okay, so we are calling the C star, the cofinality logic. Now the idea is that when we say phi defines a linear order of cofinality omega, we're using the logic as a kind of oracle, right? So in the model, C star knows which ordinals have cofinality omega in V, right? But it doesn't, the model itself, that inner model doesn't necessarily have a witness to the fact, okay? So we're, we're using these logics as, as oracles. So that's a crucial point. Okay, now, um, the Magador Mallets quantifier, right? It doesn't make any difference if you add that, assuming O sharp are just large cardinals, right? So um, I can I can give you the references. The arguments are are uh, not too difficult, not too too easy. But the point is, um, with the Magador Mallets quantifier, you're not getting any. You're not getting outside of L. On the other hand, with this cofinality logic, right? You add the quantifier phi defines a linear order of cofinality omega, right? Here we do get out of L, assuming large, large cardinals, and that depends on a very nice uh, little combinatorial lemma. Now, this is a little bit odd because um, by the Lindstrom characterization, right, a first order logic, the Magador Mallets logic is further from first order logic than cofinality logic is, right? Using the metric of the uh, Lindstrom characterization, right? Remember what I said that Magador Mallet's logic can be badly non-compact. Cofinality logic is fully compact. So cofinality logic is very, misses being first order by a hair and yet the constructible hierarchy doesn't, doesn't see that. So the constructible hierarchy is not tracking the Lindstrom characterization of, of logics consistently. Right? So that's that's odd, and that's something that um, has flummoxed us for for some time. Be nice to understand why that is. Okay, now <laughs> you invited me, so I'm going to give you a little bit of set theory. Uh, it won't last, won't, won't, won't last too long. I know many of you are friends of set theory, so I'm only joking. Um, so V equals C star, continuums at most L of two, and there are no measurables. Um, the point is you need, you need to, um, uh, cons uh, to, to witness COF 
equal omega, you need to witness coke unequal omega. So you need that extra room. It puts, pushes the continuum up. I'm going to leave the proof on the slides, but I'm not going to. The, um, that there are no measurables of B equals C star, that's just like Scott's proof. I'll just leave it here. Uh, the omega 2 of V is weakly compact in C star. And then uh, after a couple of years, we got generic absoluteness. So if there's a proper class of wooden cardinals, then the theory of C star cannot be changed by forcing. So truth is forcing absolute. And, and it's also independent of alpha, whether it's cofa, omega, cofa, something else. So the question whether the CH is true in C star, this is forcing absolute and independent of alpha. And this is, um, this is something also that we have some partial results on. We'd very much like to show that the CH holds in this inner, inner model. Um, partial results only at this, at this point. OK, and there's the proof. Um, you can separate existential, if you use existential second order logic, instead of full second order logic, let's call that HOD1, you can separate that from HOD consistently. And there's the proof. It's very nice little construction. Um, the Dodgen's core model is there. And same for the equicardinality quantifier. And then finally, um, so for a long time we had uh, in C star, we had inner models of C star, which they themselves have large cardinals in them, but no large cardinals until we use this uh, stationary logic, right? So um, we, we add the quantifier for our club of countable subsets X phi X and MM plus plus implies this axiom has been much in the news lately because of Vasco and Schindler proving that it implies the star axiom. MM plus plus implies that uncountable cardinals are measurable in CAA. So we finally got <clears throat> uh, large cardinals. And um, so, right, this is the inner model program, find a model of CFC whose theory cannot be changed by forcing and which contains large cardinals, right? So here, all we do is we add a quantifier, right? These, these inner model constructions are very complicated. Now there's much to criticize here. You can say, well, where's your fine structure, you know, so on. And also we, we don't have the upper upper echelons of large cardinal hierarchy. But anyway, we, I mean, this whole project started by thinking about what uh, Turing meant by, you know, the remarks he made about Turing and we, we kind of fell into the inner model program. Now, this is, um, uh, so Philip Welch has, has done this with the clean ramified hierarchy as a paper in the JSL. Other people have started to work on this. This is something people haven't worked on, right? What if we replace in ZFC um, in the separation and replacement axioms? So let's, let's replace the first order logic by some other logic. So we have some, some results, uh, some results there. So uh, this is a this is a you know an ongoing project. There's there's uh, there's a lot that's been done. There's a lot to do. So also a lot to do philosophically. So um, some student of Toby Meadows is writing something about how yes, constructibility is is formalism. Uh, formalism free, but not because of these logics. It's because of some other reason. So there's certainly a, a lot, a lot to, a lot to think about there. But um, as I say, the whole thing started because of thinking about how to, how to implement this, uh, how to, how to respond to Gödel's call for an absolute notion of, of definability. All right. Now, as far as the philosophers go. Um, I mean, they're very interested in second order logic and they're interested in first order logic. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to get them to 
<laughs> to be interested in what's what's in between. And that's an uphill battle, but that's another story. Okay, now um, the kind of general philosophical prob problem program around this, of course, everybody is different. Everybody draws a different moral from, um, from a set of theorems. I just wanted to, to end with um, the uh, questions that, that linger in my mind about this. So I think the program here, um, uh, uh, up, to, up to this point in the lecture, so there's a, there's a program inspired by the 46 lecture. Now, how closely inspired, whether it's how close an implementation it is, that's another story. But um, the idea here is to uh, develop calculi to study the degree to which canonical mathematical structures are entangled with or sensitive to the underlying logical formalism or alternatively persistent under a permutation of these. And the phrase that I, I use is to a degree formalism free. Now, again, uh, especially all of you, in your field, I mean, this is what you do <laughs> all the time. This is, in a sense, all you do. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I'm very well well aware of that. But um, so, uh, yeah, see, see uh, uh, Balthazar at many other talks at this meeting. You certainly have, have an enormous amount to say about the sensitivity of G1 and G2 too to you know, notation systems and you know, certainly Pfefferman going back to going back to uh, the metamathematics paper enumerations and, and so on. Okay, but what I'm advocating is a kind of organized self-conscious program to, to, to do this. So um, this phrase formalism freeness by formalism, I mean the usual thing. Right, and I would include a definition of the associated semantics there. So with this concept of a formalism, I want to associate formalism freeness, this phrase uh, with the suppression of any or all of the above aspects of a logic except semantics. Now, of course, vocabulary, right? The, the language of groups and so on uh, in the informal sense, that is to say, detached from any formalism is, is essential to the pra practice, right? And is never is not suppressed. We hope it's not suppressed. So, but here the difference is between the informal use of names in the mathematician's natural language and the act of specifying a signature for a formal language, along with other. Okay, so Tarski um, Tarski had this. Uh, so, as an example of this sort of attitude or this sort of uh, sensitivity to um, uh, 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 th these kinds of questions. So you all have seen, uh, I know, uh, Tarski's characterization of uh, universal axiomatizability, right? You, you specify some closure properties, right? This is all, this is a, a very nice semantic characterization, natural language of universal axiomatizability. So here we have a semantic characterization of a, of a syntactic property. Tarski, um, and again, I haven't seen too many people writing about this uh, in the literature on Tarski. People write a lot, of course, about the, 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 the uh, semantics and uh, also the logicality business. But he actually cared a great deal and talked a great deal about something he called the mathematical, right? starting in 1929 with his definition of, um, of um, 29 result. Sorry, my mind just goes, <laughs> just went blank. So, uh, so you have, you characterize in terms of interval, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, definable set of reals. Yeah, definable set of reals. These, these will be finite unions of, of intervals. Sorry, my mind just went, went blank there, right? So here we have definability. What could be more syntactic than that? And Tarski gives us a 
almost geometrical characterization of, of definable sets of reals. And of course, this led to O minimality and, and, and so on. So, um, I mean, Tarski, uh, so this, this, you know, he was definitely a project, product of the algebraic school in the 19th century, right? Purse and Schroeder and so on. Um, but uh, this, uh, this kind of work, which prioritizes the suppression of syntax and or logic in one form or the other and the forefronting of semantic concept, this is of course very important and you certainly see it um, in present day model theory, not, not everywhere. There's a very subtle, very careful um, use of formalisms in, in model theory. Now, sorry about this crowded slide, but I'll just read you. Here's Vaught on Tarski. Tarski gave uh, the ICM lecture in 1950. And here is Vaught uh, writing about it later. So this is, this is to illustrate this is what, Tars what, what Vault says about Tarski's conception of the, the mathematical. He says, an additional feature is that in the whole presentation, Tarski returning to and expanding his old methods manages to define notions like EC class without any mention of a formalized language. Tarski liked the idea of replacing a metamathematical definition by a mathematical one, and was even more pleased by a very mathematical one, such as Burkhoff's definition of equational class. Later on, he very much liked the purely mathematical, so these are quotes, these are presumably Tarski's, this is Tarski's language, of elementary equivalence in terms of EF games and still later definition using ultra products due to Kiesler and Schella. And then Vaught says something very funny. These very suggestive intuitive ideas may be without a precise content, as a precise distinction between mathematical and metamathematical might well be considered to be impossible because of Tarski's definition of truth. Of course, it is only in proofs that mathematicians must be precise in the important matter of selecting what to think about anything goes. But in an uncharacteristically funny mood, when I knew him, he was a fairly dour personality, but here he's obviously. All right, so I just wrote a book about this concept of formalism freeness. Um, it's, a, it's a messy concept. Uh, it's not a matter, it's not a yes or no affair, right? It's a matter of degree. Um, Baldwin has, uh, so, so John and I have been talking for many years about, um, uh, to each other about, about our work and our, our ideas and, Baldwin wrote in 2013, his paper, Formalization, Primitive Concepts and Purity, and it, it's also in his book, that an inquiry can be formalism free while being careful about the vocabulary, but it's chewing a, a choice of logic and in particular any notion of formal proof. Thus it studies mathematical properties in Tarski's sense. Okay, another uh, case of uh, indifference to um, a choice of logic. So here's from Yoko's of BSL 2000 paper, or maybe the 2012 paper, or maybe both. Uh, mathematics altogether is indifferent to a choice of logic, especially when that choice is between first order set theory and second order logic. From the practical point of view, the working mathematician will and should be indifferent to the choice between first and second order logic. And there are deep theoretical reasons why this should be the case. So I, I was very excited by Balthazar's um, talk yesterday because I, I feel we're, we're very closely allied. I mean, he's looking at the uh, variation of the you know, underlying syntactic properties like notation systems, enumeration, and so on. And I'm, I'm kind of doing the same thing if, if, if Balthazar wouldn't mind me saying so taking <laughs> riding on his coattails here, but with with logics. And not thinking about the incompleteness theorem, but thinking about things like the natural numbers and uh, others. Um, here's another case of inscrutability or a difference. Uh, recall that the Henkin semantics for second order logic is defined so that in the so-called general models, the second order variables range over fixed possibly proper subset of the power set of the domain. Um, uh, 
the, if we take the full power set, this is the one refers to the model as full or standard. Um, so uh, it seems clear that from, I mean, a number of people have pointed this out, for example, Putnam, that from the point of view of a practice, when we actually use second order logic, we don't, and in fact, cannot see a difference between the full models and the general models. And the reason for this is essentially that the general models know all the definable sets and relations by the comp comprehension axioms, and they are the ones we refer to in mathematical practice. So whatever we're doing, whatever we're constructing, those sets are going to be in the Henkin, Henkin model. Okay. Now, uh, Sam mentioned Bolzano's theorem, so I'll use it also to make my point, right? Here, um, we get the set that we need in order to prove the theorem via the second order comprehension axiom. So that's another case of sort of inscrutability. Entanglement, um, I could have used millions of examples from this meeting but uh, one I like very much concerns these zero one laws for finite structures, and they are very sensitive to signature, right? So um, it, it's zero one law says that if you have a random relational structure on the domain, one uh, uh, n element domain, this tends to uh, zero or one asymptotically, but as soon as you allow function symbols in the language, the zero, this beautiful zero one law fails. And even a sentence like <clears throat> is x fx equals x has limit prob probability one one over e, right? And as I say, there's obviously a lot of entanglement with g one g two, which you have all been been pointing out. So this is a sort of um, this is a distinction that I've I've been thinking about a lot based on um, this stream of ideas coming out of the forty six lecture and and also seeing what happens in, in this one particular calculus, right? Taking constructability or taking HOD and varying the logic, or uh, as, as Philip has done, taking the uh, ramified, cleanly ramified hierarchy, varying the logic there, and uh, other, other calculi of that, of that kind. Um, uh, pulling the camera back a little bit, uh, so the picture here is a formal and natural language constituting two separate and, and autonomous domains. Glenn, Michael Glansberg has written beautifully about this, uh, about the notion of consequence in natural language. He's got a paper on that, but that is the picture. Um, but then you can ask, right, how stable is that picture? I mean, the formal informal Distinction, does it map on to the syntax semantics distinction at all? Uh, how stable are both of these? It's, I think logicians take it for granted that the syntax semantics distinction is, is very clear. I mean, certainly starting with Hilbert, uh, the notion of syntax is thought to be just an extremely concrete um, thing. But um, once you start reading the philosophy of language literature, um, the syntax semantics distinction, I, I think you can develop an appreciation for, for what a, what a possibly unstable pro problematic distinction it is. So in philosophy of language, they ask this question, do syntactic uh, properties, I have syntactic concepts, it should, it should be properties, do syntactic properties supervene on semantic ones? So in, uh, uh, for me, the question, um, that question becomes this question, do model classes, that is to say a class of structures closed under isomorphism, have an implicit logic or implicit syntax. So, so trying, to, trying to make sense of that syntax, semantics distinction and asking how, um, how viable this idea is of formal and natural language being, being separate and autonomous domains. Now, uh, as far as model classes go, um, you can always uh, assign a, a logic, a Lindstrom, how you can cook up a generalized quantifier and so on. But the question is about, about an implicit, implicit logic. Okay, so the, the logician always has a move to make there. Okay, that's it, thank you.